Hello, my name is Stephen Dunn. I'm the author and creator of Hellness to Christendom. And if you've made it to this video, you've made it to the second part of my second interview with Vic Cipolla, who is a friend to me, but is otherwise in the conversation known as the husband of adult film star Danny Daniels, and is the author of the book Wait for the Corn, Lessons Learned from Being Married to a Porn Star. And these videos are just our conversations, our musings over different subjects in philosophy, conservatism, the nature of the state, art, even occasionally some touchings on Casablanca, wine, and some general interests that we happen to share. But in this video especially, we're talking a little bit more detail about the relationship between pornography and naked art, or the relationship between pornography and art generally, right? To see if there's any dissimilarities that exist between the naked bodies in The Last Judgment of Michelangelo, and for example, the images that we are presented in more obscene materials such as maybe softcore porn or pornography more strictly. And then, of course, at the tail end of this video, we tackle very briefly in passing subjects in religion, um, more pertaining to historicity, the Gospels, manuscript evidence, and stuff like that. So I know in the future we'll tackle those in a bit more in detail. Um, you know, as I said in the last video, there was a million things that I wanted to say. There's a million things that I could have said. And then as we kept talking more and more, I wanted to tackle on even a million more things to say on that. Um, but alas, I, I couldn't get to everything. And I think wisdom rightly made that so. So I know in future videos we'll tackle our thoughts in, in more explicit detail. We'll try to flesh out a little bit better about each other's perspectives. I did take a somewhat backseat perspective in this conversation in the sense that I was still asking more questions, but I was kind of peaking a little bit somewhat of my perspective. But I think in future articles maybe I'll talk a little bit more about Aristotle and his view of the state and we'll try and come up with a kind of conservative view towards the common good and or maybe how the state can rationally promote public virtue amongst the citizens so but conversations for a later date i hope you enjoy the video please stay tuned for future conversations and to check out the past ones as well god bless you and thank you and be sure to follow the page at wordpress and on facebook under the same name hellenistic christendom by stephen dunn stephen with a v d-u-n-n god bless you I mean, you know, like, and, and I understand. I, I understand where you're coming from on things. I, I read your, um, I read your art critique. Um, okay, <laughs> we can get to that next. But go, go ahead. Sorry, just finish this one up. But we do have to yeah. get into that next. But um, yeah, I mean, you know, it's like uh, what was um, it was Aristotle that said. I think it's it's something to the effect of um, pleasure is. Um, unimpeded activity of a natural state, I believe that was. If if it's if it's naturally yeah. something that makes you happy, right? If it's naturally something that makes you happy, it's a good thing. And I always laugh because, and obviously, I know you're going to disagree with this, but sex is about as unimpeded a natural state as you could get. <laughs> I mean, <that's>, you know, <laughs> without it, we don't exist. There ain't no next generation, and that's about as unimpeded an activity in a natural state as you could possibly get. Now, whether or not it should be on screen and film or whatnot, we can talk about. But that, as a whole, is a pleasurable experience for right. most people who aren't being violently attacked. <laughs> you know? Right, so, yeah. So, and, but but it, even, even as you were talking about family, you know, there should be something that encourages parents to be parents again. And I think that the state stepping in more and more is what the problem has become, whether it be mm. abortion laws that basically say you really don't need to be responsible for a life that you have created, which starts the process and then ends with don't worry about it. We'll feed them. We'll teach them sex education. We'll teach them death education. We'll give them all the education they have except the actual education they need. You know, so you have this entire span of a child's life from, from birth, whether you choose that they are alive or not, to graduation and heading to college that the parents are almost told, yeah, don't worry about it. We got you. We got this. Right. Horrible. Horrible, horrible. Why, it's why kids have guns underneath their beds. The parents don't know about it, and they go shoot up a school later on. I mean, that's really what it comes. You know, if you if you don't want your kid watching pornography, then you need to talk to them about why you don't think that's right. You need to get them to understand our point of view. You don't. If you go in the door and you rip the Playboy out from underneath their bed, guess what they're buying tomorrow? Another Playboy. <laughs> <laughs> happening, you know. Well, my curious is. And like I said, it's probably more fundamental is that is there any truth in those values that differ among people who say you should talk to your kids about sexuality? So, for example, you may th you may think 
parents ought to have the right to, you know, tell their kids that porn is bad. But is, could it be the case that that view is mistaken? Could they be I telling mean, them an error about the world? You know, yeah, they could be. I mean, but I don't know who makes that judgment other than the parent. I mean, you, you, you're, mm. you're, you're the, I mean, that when you take that responsibility off the parent's shoulder, what the hell is your job anymore? I mean, that's what yeah. your job is as a parent is to shepherd this child into a society and hopefully create a, a good person for society that contributes in some way, as minuscule as it might be. And, you know, listen, I'll, I'll give you an example right now in New York. And we, I think we talked about it, at seven o'clock, my wife goes out, we cheer all of the workers. You know, the simplest pe people on the planet that have jobs that most people didn't even look at, the grocery clerk, the janitor in the hospital, the guy who's picking up your garbage, right now, they're better than the guy who throws the greatest curveball ever for the New York Yankees, because without them, we're, we're screwed. You know, mm. go to a grocery store right now, and that poor girl or guy is making minimum wage, whatever your state's minimum wage is, and every day, they are literally just in the back of their head hoping to God, one of the people that come by doesn't have coronavirus and is infecting them. Yeah. They're showing up every day. So, you know, the idea is to contribute to society by creating that kid and giving them that level of responsibility and making them understand that responsibility is important. And whether it's responsibility, as you would say, to not watch pornography or it's responsibility to have a work ethic or it's responsibility to understand what pornography or movies or fantasy is, whatever the responsibility is, teaching responsibility is the first and most primary importance on a parent's back. And if you give the government that responsibility, the government has zero responsibility to begin with. What makes you think they're going to be able to teach it? Mm. Um, this may be an odd question, but how do you how do you know that? I have two kids. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, so I was going to say I was going to say more specific. Like why why is it that those values that we why should people aspire to be like that kid at the grocery store, for example? Because if it wasn't for that kid at the grocery store, we'd all be starving. <laughs> I mean, I got seriously, you. no one shows up to work. No, no one drives that truck to drop off the fruit. No one in that goes in that field and picks that fruit. No one shows up at work because they go, holy shit, coronavirus hit and we don't have to do anything anymore. And all of us are, are you know, a week away from death. So, mm. yeah, I mean, how, how do you know that's right? That's a pretty good indication of it. Um, yeah, but it seems yeah. that you've, but now you've back to a more, something more basic, right? It, it appeals to feeding people now. And feeding people pertains to maintaining life. Right. So, so, for example, maybe the state can be involved in those kind of basic human goods, right? That life is a good thing. Play is a good thing. Aesthetic experience yeah. is a good thing. Um, even but religion. Always, yeah, but you, you also have those problems. I mean, you have, you have a, a, a constitution that prohibits re religious uh, combination with government. You know, we shall establish no religion. Does it... The, my personal opinion, it doesn't keep religion out of government. It just says the government shall not establish a religion, but that's been right, right. You know, interpreted a million different ways at this point. You also have um, an example, the National Endowment for the Arts, um, funding Maplethorpe exhibits that I personally think suck, and many people, <laughs> fi many people find offensive, but many people also find it intriguing. So, you know, yeah. how much of this do you deal with and dole out before you go, okay, basic necessities are basic necessities. A, a universal right is a right that is not impeding anybody else's decision. I have a right to be alive. Personally, I have a right to be alive. I have my choices. I can smoke, I can drink, I can do things that make me a diabetic and give me a possibility towards cancer. You shouldn't have to pay for me though, to have that right. right. And if you do pay for me, then you should be able to tell me what I can eat and can't eat. And now you have a problem. Same thing with education. People should have a right to education. But if I give it to you for free, then no one's taking ancient Sanskrit ever again because <laughs> I'm not paying for that. You know, <laughs> right. so, you know, you know you, basic human rights are basic human rights, life, liberty, the pursuit of property, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So just to, for the sake of, of uh, moving forward, um, I was going to confirm, you actually were right on Aristotle. Pleasure is the natural accompaniment of unpeated activity. Hey, look at that. Uh, <laughs> if you got that to the, to the dot, yeah. Um, well, you know, so just for people watching, you know, we, of course, correspond back and forth on Instagram kind of yeah. you know, minimally. But I, I mentioned that I was going to send it to you when I had it ready, but I never actually sent it to you because once I finished the article, I thought, uh, okay, it's not that I'm scared, but it's like, 
I, I'm glad we're just talking about it now rather than yeah, yeah. <laughs> you before. Whether, it, whether, right. whether or not pornography is an art. Um, I guess no, it, there's a qu the yeah. question that I had for you was, is entertainment art? Is a television show art? So looking to Aristotle's definition, it seems that minimally, yes. Insofar as we were working on the definition of art as art is imitation. Art right. is like something. Right. Um, so in a basic sense, yeah, entertainment, people getting shot. You mentioned last week or a few yeah, days violence. ago. Yeah, women in tr plays being raped, yeah. tortured, and et cetera. So Aristotle would in some sense say that, you know, of course it's art. Now the question becomes, what are these instances, these ecstatic experiences oriented towards? What are they for? And right. basically my, my argument tries to go that direction. Yeah, and, and I saw it, and, but I, there was one thing I disagree with. You said that if you told the director these, and you, you, you mentioned off a list of things, the people were beautiful, blah, 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 but you uh, said it didn't turn you on. The director would be either confused or they would be thrilled you watched it. <laughs> they wouldn't be any of those things. <laughs> so, I, but I, I guess, I mean, Beethoven famously once said, music inspires you to do something. If I play a march, you march. If I play a mass, you pray. Mm. So if I create a titillating video, I expect titillation. If I'm not achieving that, then I didn't do my job right. It means that my, what I did was wrong for, for a certain viewing audience. Um, art is that way too. If I go see a horror film and I am not horrified, it didn't do its job. If you see a pornographic movie and it doesn't turn you on, if that was the intent of it, then it didn't do its job for you. But every viewer is different. You know, there are some people who think Picasso is a greater painter than Michelangelo. They're wrong, but they believe it. <laughs> yeah. you but it, it's interesting that actually it, it seems like we agree that titillating images are for the end of provoking titillating feelings. Absolutely. In a Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you know, even, even classical art forms. I mean, Beethoven, Beethoven's my, my absolute favorite composer, period. My favorite music of all time. Um, but Beethoven was was a, a Republican. I mean, he was he was banging at the door of Metternich and basically saying, "Go screw yourself," and doing uh, these these wild, you know, overtures in the most conservative society at the time, Vienna. You mm -hmm. know, his stuff was in their mind pornographic. It's the greatest music ever written. But in his, in many people's mind, that was you know the Fifth Symphony, the Ninth Symphony, the mm -hmm. Emperor Concerto, the Eroica. I mean, these things were considered way over the top at the time now <laughs> most people can't even figure out what the hell they mean but it, it's you know so it it did it did it inspire anything did it mm. did it do, do what he wanted it to do was he correct when i play a march do you march to war mm. is really i guess what you know all artworks I, my wife and i are we love going to art museums i mean we have traveled the world just to go to art museums and everywhere you go there is always Massive paintings to the murder of the innocents, the biblical mm -hmm. version of the murder of the innocents. Yeah. And we pass by the, and they are horrific. Yeah. Murdering babies, horrible, right? They yeah. inspire exactly what they're supposed to inspire. Holy shit, that's horrific. But we also turn to each other and go, would you ever put this in your house? <laughs> would you ever hang this painting, you know, walk in the door? Oh, hey, yeah, that's my couch. There's a bunch of dead babies. I mean, it's just... You know, is it art because it gave you the inspiration it was supposed to? Yes, but is it something that's going in my living room? No, <laughs> probably not. Yeah, um, I think you would appreciate the argument only because, you know, it's perfect that your wife is an artist. And basically my yeah. argument is, is kind of trying to say that, for example, for example, the kind of stuff that's going on with pornography is very different uh, in form and in intention with the art that, you know, exists with Kara Lee, for example. Right, right. But I mean, they're also, they're, they're, it's, the, you know, the Marshall McLuhan, the message of the medium. I mean, it's a different medium for a different topic. Uh, you know, one of the things that, that we enjoy doing is we go to modern art museums. Mm. Most of it is to get a laugh. I mean, <laughs> uh, you know, honestly, to, seriously, like we look and go, this is funny. We were in MoMA and we walked up to a wall that looked like somebody stole a painting looked like they cut a piece of sheetrock out and there was plywood behind it with like the red letters that you normally see in plywood. And I'm like, oh my God, did somebody steal a painting? No, no, that was the art. That was the art. <laughs> and we laughed our asses off. Now, is it art or isn't it art? Many people say it's not, but we laughed. 
We laughed. Right. We enjoyed it. We enjoyed looking at it. We took pictures of it. We sent it to our family and friends. Guess it's art, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, Warhol, Warhol, Warhol said, art is what you can get away with. They got away with it, you know? <laughs> Yes, but that, but I don't want to do that kind of like lump sum kind of view of art only because I think it, it retains integrity and quality that existed with, for example, the past masters. So like, yeah. just, just think about the last 50 years with like cubism or more abstract forms and postmodernism and stuff like that. Um, I'm thinking of this one guy who has, um, starts with a K, I forget his name, but the black square. And I remember he did a, a public shoot with it and he said that it is in that square that I can see the face of God. And it's just like modern art is just going all over the place with this kind of relativism that exists in the images. And yeah. so I don't know if you're familiar with like, so I use Ducamp's uh, toilet. You saw that I used yeah, that? That's right, the toilet, yeah. I mean, Juan, and, Juan Miro is another perfect example. I mean, Juan Miro has a painting that's an entire canvas of white that's the size of his room behind me. And it has one black dot in the middle of it. And his concept was, in the absence of anything, even a black dot is something. Well, he's right, because your eyes go right to that black dot. <laughs> I mean, you walk in the room, and you're like, why is there this black dot in the middle of this canvas? So, you know, what, I mean, what do you think? You know, Dolly, I mean, you have all of these Cubist masters. But, I mean, you take a look at Picasso. As he started going on later in life, I mean, it looked like he was mailing it in. I mean, there's a big difference between the La Guanica <laughs> and, you know, just a big couple of X's in line, you know? <laughs> Yeah. Was it, uh, I'm curious, just because this, I don't know if, did you have an, do you like Dali, for example? Yeah, I love Dali, yeah. Do you have an opinion of him, like, pre-conversion to Catholicism to, like, his post-Catholicism works? You know, so, yeah, he did that nuclear mysticism period. Uh -huh, um, yeah. Where he did um, uh, a, a whole bunch of, of stuff. And I saw his, uh, I was at the Dali Museum in Tampa, actually, and they had a bunch I've of- I've never been to that. Oh, it's gorgeous. Go. Yeah, you, I mean, you're, you're, you're a rock throw away. Go. They, you would love it. They have some really great pieces. Dolly was, Dolly was a PR madman. I mean, you know, <laughs> he, he famously walked two anteaters into a subway station in, in Paris, France. He walked around with an ocelot. I mean, you know, he ate I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. He ate camembert cheese late, late at night to the point that it made him sick because he thought it would give him the dreams necessary to create his next painting. So, you know, <laughs> but. He was an incredible artist. I have uh, one of his uh, unicorn prints in the other room, um, and I love his stuff, you know, Persistence of Memory. I mean, I love Dolly. I love all of his work. Uh, and his, you know, he was a great, he really was a great painter. And his nuclear mysticism period was, was phenomenal. But that was him trying to figure out how to bring physics and Christianity together on a painting. You yeah. Know, God bless you, man. That's a, that's a, <laughs> that's a, that's a major jump. You know? <laughs> No, yeah, I, I, uh, I had, I was pursuing a second degree in theoretical physics, and that's what kind of drew me to him uh, when I was first yeah. studying art, that integration. But yeah, go um, to the Dali Museum. Seriously, go to the Dali Museum. <laughs> I was, I was just about to, and then I started hearing the word about quarantine, and then this was literally like two months ago, so I was really upset yeah. I didn't go. It'll open but, uh, up again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, no, I guess so. We're coming up right at an hour. Um, I was just going to say, if there's anything like you had questions about any other things you'd want to cover? Um, Cause now that we've had this conversation, I literally have like a million other questions <laughs> for things we could talk about on, on otherwise. But I mean, you'll notice that like our conversation isn't too cheeky, you know? No, it's not. No. So, so I'm curious to like, you know, touch base a little bit more about maybe some religious subjects. You said you had some thoughts about like organized religion in your book. So that'd be yeah, cool to cover. I, 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 I guess my, my, my biggest problem with organized re religion is, um, hypocrisy. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah, you have, I mean, you have a group of, uh, I mean, look, whether you believe Jesus Christ was our savior, you don't believe Jesus Christ was our savior, you could pretty much go with the fact that he was probably the most peaceful human being to ever exist whether he was divine or not. He was definitely peaceful, you know, offer him your other cheek. I mean, maybe, you know, forgive your brother, not seven times, but 70 times, seven times. I mean, you know, he mm -hmm. was, and more violence has been done in his name than any other human being or person that has ever existed by organized religion. You know, let's, let's slaughter an entire group of Arabs because they're in the holy ground and we need his cup back. It's like, come on, man. I mean... <laughs> You know, you know it's, a, it's a big, big jump from the source material, wouldn't you say? I mean, it's kind of a far departure from reading the Bible and going, well, I don't know where it's said, you know. Yeah. Onward Christian soldiers being the perfect example of that. 
So my, so my two questions, one, are you, do you believe in God in any sense? Is there like a, I do. I do. Okay. Is there, is there like a term you would ascribe to it? Like what's the closest thing it would look like? I don't know. I kind of, I kind of like Einstein's, you know, God, God doesn't play okay. nice with the universe. <laughs> I got you. Kind of like a optimistic deism, I guess. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, you know, it's like out of chaos breeds order. I think that was Nietzsche, but um, uh, when, when chaos theory shows you that even in the most chaotic of situations, there's order, you got to wonder why, <laughs> you know, there's, there's, yeah. there's a reason for that. <laughs> yeah. And now my second question was more on religious terms. As far as Jesus being divine, why do you think, why do you think not? Why is there, is there truth in religion? Was kind of my question. I, you know, I, 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 I don't, I don't know. Um, what I can say is this, there's something there. And the reason being is that on Friday, Jesus was crucified. Mm. On Saturday, his disciples were in, uh, were in hiding. And on Sunday, they came out preaching the word of God and all died very horrible deaths. All of them mm. I mean horrible. Uh, so you take Jesus. The word. You take these as historical facts? I mean, it's, you know, the Romans are pretty good at history. <laughs> Say what you want okay. about the Romans. They're pretty right. good at history. So these things, something happened. These things happened. And I think that it's pretty solid that it did happen, that Jesus did exist. Whether he was the savior or he wasn't the savior, he did exist. He did preach certain things. There are enough historical documents to prove that, that he existed as a person. And there are enough historical documents that show that they went into hiding that they all thought they were going to get rounded up by the, by the Romans and, and crucify themselves. And then day later, they were all out preaching and none of them died really. You know, I mean, St. Peter was crucified upside down. One of them was disemboweled and had hot lead poison. I mean, it was just, you know, they did, but they still preached it. So, I don't know, something happened, you know, something happened. Yeah. You know, that's where faith comes in. I mean, I guess that's, that's the point of faith. It's like, I can't prove this, but you know, there was, I yeah. can't remember, there was a, there was a astronomer or a physicist that said, you know, I, I see footsteps in the sand. I don't know that a person walked there, but there are footsteps in the sand, you know, the, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. extrapolation. I don't know that Jesus rose from the grave, but a day after you thought you were going to be crucified and were in hiding, you were out preaching, something happened. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. I guess I can kind of, kind of cap it there. Like I said, we will definitely, there's so many things we can talk about, but um, yeah, man. Is there any other like questions, anything else, I guess? No, I just, uh, um, I was, it was funny. I was, I was reading through your, your stuff today and um, I didn't, I, I didn't know if we were going to get to Ann Rand or not. So I, I had to oh. reread, I had to reread a little Ann. <laughs> I, you know, it's funny. I did too. And I didn't even think to like cover it. And it's, it was in my mind when you were talking, but you know, I'm a person who goes thought to thought to thought to thought. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I, I, but, I loved, I, I, I was always a, a, a fan of hers. Um, and yeah, she, she always had battles, but there's some yes. of her stuff I like. She was not very religious, but growing up in Soviet Russia, it was kind of, I think, beaten out of her. Um, that's, so. and that's what I kind of was going to touch on with you is like, I was, I was very Ayn Rand myself um, yeah. in my early undergrad years, but Aristotle kind of took me out of it. And it's because I think she grossly misunderstood the status position in that she, I remember I was reading a book I have right here in front of me. Uh, she says in her book, Objectivist Ethics or Objectivist Epistemology mm -hmm. or whatever, um, to be an Aristotelian and a status is a contradiction in terms. And the essay I have is just talking about how, like, she didn't even read Aristotle. She's making that claim. And I mean, if you don't, you do have to understand she lived underneath the states of all states. So, yeah, so, she, of course you would. I mean, it's, she, she's, she, you're looking at, you know, we're looking at this as the state being good. She saw what it was like when the state was bad. Yeah. And she also knows that to go from good to bad is but one, you know, I mean, what was it? The Franklin had said, you know, uh, freedom isn't going to be taken away with war. It's going to be taken away to cheers. And mm -hmm. look at what's, look what's going on right now. I mean, I, you know, I understand. I understand coronavirus. I think it's a very serious thing. But think about how easy basically taking everybody's freedoms away was. Yeah. We're just... You know, authoring of a pen that we're not even sure was legal. No one's even sure that the, the governor or the senator or anybody has literally the rights to shut businesses down because they want to. But they did it, and everybody went, okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, I mean, her point is really easy to understand. I always had, I, I, I loved, I loved, um, I loved reading Plato and Aristotle. I didn't really agree with them. I always had a bit of a problem with Aristotle, though. So I think being a historian, I don't think mm. we really know Aristotle because most of his works were destroyed. I mean, he did 200, 250 Trieste, and we only got like 30 of them. 
And a lot of them, everybody thinks were, were um, educational and learning materials specifically that he used for Alexander the Great. So mm -hmm. we're not sure if he was dumbing down some stuff, you know, like you would when you're trying to teach a, a kid. So I don't know that we, you know, sadly don't know that we know who real Aristotle was. There's a lot, sadly, a lot of his that was lost, a lot. Like the majority of his work were gone. You know, most of Plato's work survived, but most of Aristotle's didn't. I mean, think of even, even the Gospels of the Bible. I mean, you know, most of them were oral. They weren't written down for almost 60 to 100 years. And then at the Council of Nicaea, a whole bunch of people sat around and went, yeah, we don't like this one. <laughs> well, what was in the one you didn't like? I want to read that one. <laughs> you know, I'm sorry. Uh, you, know, you had 12 yeah. disciples. We have, I don't know, was it six Gospels or seven Gospels? So there's a bunch of Gospels that are written, that were written, that aren't there. What did they say? What was the big, you know, it's like, how, how much of a disagreement was there between them? Oral history is, I mean, you know, if you ever talk to a police officer, the worst possible thing on the planet is an eyewitness um, testimony because no one ever gets it right. So now you got a bunch of eyewitness testimonies. And now we went, well, these seven kind of agree, but I guess these few over here don't. So yeah, just throw them on the ash sheet. We're done with that crap. <laughs> Oh man! You know, and, and 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 like I said, being a historian at heart, you look at that and go, "It's just, it's lost, it's gone, it's just, it's gone." You I know? got you, dude. Okay, next week, <laughs> <laughs> I'm already laughing about it so much. I'm sorry. It's just next week we're 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 gonna talk. I want to talk history. I want to talk more about like kind of what's going on there, because um, I don't agree. I think we have very early accounts of the Gospels. Uh, the Gospel of John was written sometime in the 90s when Jesus died in, you know, sometime in the 30s. Paul was writing sometime in the 60s, citing creeds. Yeah, about, but Paul wasn't a yeah, but Paul wasn't a, a a disciple. Paul was Paul was an enemy at one point. <laughs> he was Saul. He was, you know, but he but you he know, was still an, the road he was to Damascus. A, right. So he was still an apostle who had uh, an experience with the risen Christ. Yeah, he no. did. He, well, he claimed to have, he claimed to have an experience with the risen Christ. That I'm not so sure <laughs> of. I, I think he saw the writing on the wall, so to speak. But um, <laughs> but he he wasn't he wasn't there for the 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 actual you know, right. passion and 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 what happened. Um, so his his term, but I, I, I we do it like no, I know you're right. I mean, I agree with you. John's was written early, but it's still 60 years later. I mean, I'm 53 years old. I still got seven more years to go before I should start writing about what I did when I was one years old. Good luck. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's a long time. But even, even if you, even if you, accept, and, I, and I have no problem, even if you accept them all, even if there's still some that are gone and we don't know what they said, they all wrote a gospel. That is fact. They all wrote a gospel and they're gone. And the question is, is why? Because a whole bunch of guys who had no freaking clue what they were doing sat in a room and said, we don't like that one. <laughs> I mean, my, my all-time yeah. favorite was, was Mary Magdalene. You know, it, unless, I mean, depending upon which Bible you read, she's never actually referred to as a prostitute. Never. She just, right. happens to, she just happens to come after the prostitute being stoned, who isn't named. Mm -hmm. So, was she? <laughs> you know, yeah. She supposedly wrote a gospel. We have no idea what the hell she said. Then you, right, have, yeah. the da Vinci, you have the Da Vinci Code lunatics who said she went to France and fathered the French people because only the French people would think that they were children of Jesus Christ. <laughs> it's like, oh my gosh! Yeah, no, it's I know. Just, it's, you know, revisionist history is a fun stuff. To, it's fun stuff. <laughs> It's like people who want to pretend the Civil War didn't exist. It's like, yeah, 600,000 people died. I think the Civil War existed, guys. You know? <laughs> no, but um, thank you again for your time. No, bless Gladly. you, honestly. Um, yeah. like, I guess, like I said, I know I've already asked that three times probably. Anything else? I mean, is uh, something for next time?